Okay, so I just want to welcome everybody to NEN's annual general meeting. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Darren Seeger. I'm uh, proud to be the GP chair of NEN. Um, and we have an hour and a half to take you through sort of our, our annual report, annual review, and, and where we're going as a clinical commissioning group. Um, I have the usual uh, um, things that we have to say in any meeting like this. So there's no fire drill. So if you smell smoke, run that way and out the front door. Um, this, as, you, as you've seen, we are recording this. Um, with a video, so I'm told that I can't move anywhere from this spot. Um, and we're going to upload this onto our website. So uh, um, there are empty chairs, but we did have more people than we could accommodate um, in this. So, so I'm sure there'll be more people coming. So um, we're going to I'm going to speak for about um, half an hour, and we're going to show it the. Um, and in the middle of that, we're going to show a, a, a video, a short video of, of some of the work that we've been doing. So without further ado, if we could start. Um, and, and just a reminder that if you do have questions, if you um, can either give, it, give your questions to the ladies at the back, and we'll have a question and answer right at the end. So we'll try and take all of your questions at the end rather than throughout the uh, meeting. So, so um, again, I, I'd just like to um, explain the way we're structured. So we are different than other CCGs. So NEN is um, the sixth largest clinical commissioning group in the country. We're made up of eight localities, and the localities are shown uh, uh, diagrammatically there. The way it works is that each um, practice in those localities elects a representative to represent the practice at a locality board. And those locality boards meet once a month. And, and those localities elect a representative that becomes their locality chair. Um, within, and, and so we're essentially a clinically led, locality driven clinical commissioning group. And that, so there's different models throughout the country. But just to explain, then, so we cover. 640,000 patients across Northamptonshire. Um, and we have about 400 GPs, and there's 69 practices. So, that's, so we are in essentially a, a membership organization. So I just wanted to run through our, our vision, mission, and values. So essentially, what we're all about is to help people lead the best possible life from beginning to end. So, so that's what drives us every day. Our, our vision, um, and you'll hear more about this, is to provide better health, better care, and better value. Because as you know, NHS resources are being squeezed all the time. And so we have to make the best possible use of, of that um, resource. And the values that we work as an organization, and we, we had a lot of staff consultation through this, so, so the culture of the organization is driven by four values, and that's being effective, being compassionate, uh, being supportive, and safe. So again, the whole changes of the NHS were driven about essentially for um, clinicians to work together with the local residents to provide, to use that limited resource to best value. So it, it was back in 2012 that we actually did a major consultation exercise where we're, we uh, consulted with 13,000 residents. So, um, and, and what we asked for, well, what, what were your priorities that, that you wanted us to do? And they were boiled down to, to four essential priorities. So preventing premature death is as a result of heart disease, stroke, and cancer, um, which I'm sure you'd all agree with. Improve how we manage patients with long-term conditions, such as diabetes and asthma. Improving health by reducing the number of people who are, are obese, smoke, and um, drink too much alcohol. And change the way we deliver services so we can improve the quality of patient care. So I think you know that, that those are um, really great priorities that we're able to, to work with. Um, within the context and how we're judged as a clinical commissioning group is through the NHS outcomes framework. So that's, so NHS England is the overarching body of the health service, 
And, and we have five domains which we work through, and there's an incredible amount of detail underneath all this, but the, the domains are, that match closely to the priorities that you set us, was around preventing people from dying prematurely, and enhancing the quality of life with people with long-term conditions, helping people to recover from episodes of ill health or injury, ensuring that people have positive experiences of care, and treating and caring for people in a safe environment and protecting them from avoidable harm. So again, that, that all dovetails nicely with, with, with the challenges that we've been set. Locally, there's the Health and Wellbeing Board, and again, through that, that's, uh, uh, that's hosted by the County Council. The Chair, Robin Brown, is, is here. Um, and, and, and the Health and Wellbeing Board set three strategic outcomes, and that was essentially that every child is safe and has the best possible start in life, because we know how important that is for both their emotional and physical well-being, that vulnerable adults and elderly patients are safe and able to use services and support um, that helps them to live as independently as possible, and that people have healthier lifestyles and exert greater control over their health and well-being. So again, it just, just another example of reinforcing that. So we know we have a lot of challenges um, in the county, and, and um, my colleagues will, will go through those in more detail. Um, but when we, we had a big health conversation, that so NHS England, and uh, we're keen that actually every local area sort of set out those challenges for the population. And, and, and we, we had a big event at the uh, Saints Ground where over 100 people attended. And again, we, we, and we asked them four questions. So the four questions, and, and, and everybody had voting buttons. So essentially, the, the, the question posed was, the NHS can no longer continue to provide all services in the same way that it has in the past. 70% agreed quite strongly. NHS resources should be targeted to those with greatest medical needs. 60% agreed. The best place to deliver cares as close as possible to home. 83% agreed, and services need to be transformed if we're able to meet the challenges facing health and social care. So again, 83% agreed. So again, that, that's given us a, a, a very clear mandate of what we need to do as a clinical commissioning group. The review of last year was that we, we worked as a, a health economy, so that's with our health partners. So uh, we, there's a clinical commissioning group in Corby, uh, there's um, Kettering General Hospital, Northampton General Hospital, Northamptonshire Healthcare Foundation Trust, and the County Council. And, and we agreed on four work streams initially, and this was last year, um, and it, it formed part of Healthier Northamptonshire. And this has evolved, but I just, as a review of last year, I just wanted to explain that those are the, the seven key work streams that, that, in order for us to achieve the, the context of meeting all the um, NHS outcomes domains and the priorities that you set us, that those were the work pro programs of how we were going to do that. Essentially, that boils down to how do we in integrate and individualize care so that we wrap all the services, all the healthcare services around the individual patient. So this is a, a, a complicated diagram. You won't be able to read all the writing, but the important bit is is the bit in the middle that's the, the patient and it's, and it's that services wrap around the patient and, and that they're able and we empower patients to provide that individualized self-care. So again, so just going over, um, just coming towards the end of my, my um, introduction, but essentially the key challenges are, you know, that, that we faced in, in our first year were financial. And uh, Stuart Rees, our chief finance officer, will follow me so I won't steal his thunder, but essentially we had to declare that we were in financial recovery, and he'll explain the implications of that in more detail. In terms of um, performance, so, so the, th the three key challenges were around finance, performance, and quality. So performance, um, so the, um, the con NHS constitution is that no patient should wait, uh, or less than 5% of patients who attend A&E should not wait more than four hours um, 
for if they attend A and E, and and that's a, a very complex uh, performance outcome measure that we work together as a health economy to sort. But but we knew we had issues both at Northampton General and Kettering General, and it's actually uh, we've got the chief executive of Kettering General, but they they have remarkably turned around their performance in the last few months, and that's been commended in the House of Commons for the way for going from one of the worst performing to actually one of the best performing in the whole country. Um, the, we, for, um, we have a challenge around this 62 cancer day standard. So that's essentially when a GP refers a patient under the um, suspected cancer two week wait um, program, that they should have definitive treatment within 62 days of that original referral. And, and at the moment, we're, we're just under that, that uh, performance standard. Um, we have challenges so uh, around 18 week, what's called referral to treatment. So again, when a GP refers a patient and they require an operation, that should be done within 18 weeks. Um, and so we have particular challenges around orthopedics that, that, that has, is being sorted. And our colleagues in the ambulance service are particularly challenged um, around the, the response times. And we work very closely with them in order to try and um, improve those, those um, response times. Um, in terms of quality, we had some issues around um, um, infection rates, so MRSA you know, is a particularly nasty bug, and Clostridium difficile um, infection rates. So we were above our thresholds, but again, our director of quality um, and his team have actually worked very closely with the hospitals and community staff to, uh, to address those. Um, so, so boiled down, th those are our key challenges. In terms of our key successes, um, so as an as a organization, um, we became fully authorized. So initially, um, in the transition between the sort of old NHS system and the new system, uh, we were set um, some, some um, standards that we had to meet as an or organization. So we were authorized with conditions. We strengthened our organization. Um, and, and so a, a key success was actually that we're able to function very effectively as, as a clinical commissioning group. Um, uh, we um, worked again with our healthcare partners to set up the frail and elderly crisis hub, so um, that, that essentially was trying to facilitate early discharge of frail and elderly patients once they were admitted because there's very strong evidence the longer somebody stays in hospital, actually the, the function deteriorates. So the quicker we can get them out, it's better for the individual patient and better for the healthcare organizations because they can treat more patients. Um, we improved self-care for young patients with mental health issues. So in Northamptonshire, we have a particular problem with safeguarding and, um, and rates of young people with mental health problems. And, and so we developed, again, with the healthcare partners, a, a, a sort of website that's used both by, and it was developed in conjunction with young people. So that it's called Ask Norman. If you Google that, it'll come up. It, it's, a, it's, a por, it's a porthole for both healthcare professionals and, yeah, um, and young people to access help when they need it. Um, we improved the quality of care in care homes, so we, we invested a lot of training into um, the staff that look after these very, very vulnerable patients, because each of them are individual business units, and, and so our, our quality, quality team actually worked with the staff to improve standards so they could look after patients better. Um, there's, in the transforming and, and developing general practice, um, the model for general practice that's been going since 1948 really isn't fit for purpose anymore. And so we know that um, actually the individual GP practices have to work much more closely together. And, and there's three federations that have formed. So it's been talked about for more than 10 years, and it's just happened this year. So that's, there's a federation in the north of the county, a federation in Northampton, and a federation in the south. And there, it's, it's very embryonic at the moment, but it's, it's around um, primary care really working much more closely together. Um, 
part of that is developing locality specialty clinics. So particularly people with skin conditions, they're treated much more closer to home, very high patient satisfaction rates, um, you know, because essentially um, dermatology is the specialties known, doesn't really need to be, uh, the patients don't really need to go to hospital for that. It can be done in any community setting. Um, and, and, and we've actually met the vast majority of the key NHS performance and quality standards. So, in, and lastly, we're a national lead for a personal health budget, so the personalization that both health and actually the county council have as well. So I'm just going to end my talk with, it, with a, a short video. If it starts. Hi, I'm Kenny West and this is Pat Haslam. Um, we work for NCCG as part of the Northampton localities. As part of what we do in our locality, we go out to public events to speak to the public and advise them on where they can access the best services for them at the right time. On Saturday the 16th of August, we were invited to take part in one of these events at UPS. And the event once again showed how, it is, how important it is for NEN to have engagement with the public, that the majority of the public just don't know what is available to them. And this is why events like this, what we do, are so important. Thank you. This video contains some of their responses to some of our questions that we ask at all of our events. We hope you enjoy it. Well, 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 well. There were so many. Oh, that's, that is a lot of people. I don't want to know that many people. Texts, emails, phone calls, text message, email. One of the things I know, if I think about my dentist, they send you a reminder, text message, like the day before your appointment. Yes, because then I think they'll maybe consider not using A and E if it's a, like a minor problem, or you know they might think again about using it. You know, the, you know, the price of the resources and everything. So. To get the message across to everyone. Really. Uh, I think days like today raise the awareness, especially with children. It brings awareness to the whole safety and health of children. Um, I guess so you can get, get the opinion of, of the public. Yeah. So thank you for watching. If I'm going to hand you over to Stuart Rees now, who's going to take us through the finances. Okay, everybody. So that's probably the most exciting bit now. We'll talk about finance. <laughs> so everybody's all, all jokes, but everybody's always interested in finance. Well, I've got to remember not to move, <laughs> which is quite difficult for me. So and I will talk about us putting in the, ourselves in financial recovery a bit. 
Well, I'll just introduce a bit about this. So, we have developed a five-year financial strategy with our partner organisations, which I'll come on to in a minute. I'll also present how we did last year and what it's going to look like going forward and what that means for our health economy and social care partners. Our initiatives we're doing to bring us back in the line. Because what you'll hear is, over the next five years, with health and social care, we got quite a challenge. Okay, so last year, we put ourselves into financial recovery back in November. Hello. <laughs> what we got is two, two lots of allocations for CCG. We got 661 million to spend on what we call program, which is pure healthcare where we spend it. And then we get 15.2 million to spend on running costs. There are two targets, both with, of which we have to stay within. So the first one, under what they call the business rules, we're meant to generate a 1% surplus, which is NHS England's operating rules. In November, we said, that's gonna be a bridge too far, because that, required us to do savings in Europe nearly 40 million. So we agreed with NHS England, we would have a target of only 430,000. So you can imagine that's unbelievably tight when you're spending 661 million. That is nothing. So we're managing to a very tight deadline. Deadline? Financial control. But what you have to remember in the context of this is within our health economy, which is classed as challenged. We have two providers that also have controlled deficit positions. So we remember we spend most of our money within this health economy. If you think of that 661 million, we spend 180 odd million with NGH, just over 100 million with KGH, and just over another 100 million with NHFT. And they're the three main providers within the county. So anything we do, it will obviously have a major impact on them. So we're working in partnership. But we managed to hit both them. We underspend slightly in all of them. We also, another rule we have to do is pay non-NHS invoices. We have to pay 95% of them. And we did that as well. And then we have to have not spend more cash than we're allowed to draw down. And we managed to do that. So we hit all of our sort of statutory administrative targets, but we didn't hit the business rules. But we did that in conjunction and agreement with NHS England. So, how did we spend our money? This is where we spent our money. As you can see, most of, most of money went on acute services. So 56% went on acute services. It's a perspective, that's... 374 million on acute services we spent. So that gives you an idea. So biggest spend acute, next is prescribing, then mental health, and that's the way it goes down. At commissioning organisations, we spend most of our money with other organisations on patient care. So that's important, that's what we're here to do. So per head of population, for all the people we serve, this is how we spend the money on population. So again, obviously, cute to be the biggest, at £613 per head of population we spent. That doesn't mean we actually spent that on every individual, but that's the average we spent per head of population. So, the challenge going forward. There is a large challenge for the NHS. You'll have seen by, in the press, initially, it was, we had to save £20 billion by 2015. Now, the NHS is on target to do that, However, by 2021 now, that challenge has become 30 billion. For Northamptonshire, the whole of Northamptonshire, including health and social care, we're talking about a challenge of about 280 million that we're gonna solve between us. Now we're working in partnership to do that amongst all the organizations. So how will we spend our money in the next five years? So we've agreed a plan as we speak. It will most probably get refined over the next few weeks, but we've, we've aligned it with our partner organisations. 
So what you can see there is our program spend, which does go up from 663 all the way up to 748 to spend. We do get a cut in the running cost allowance. We have a 10% target to save on the running. So there will be a reduced allocation. But this is how we then plan to spend the money for the next five years. And what you can see, what's critical, is where we spend our money it is interlinked with other partner organisations in this health economy. 64% of our spend is with NGH, KGH, NHFT, and the Ambulance Trust and Oxford, all very re provide organisations that are used by pe people in Northamptonshire a lot. So we work together. And this is how we plan to spend the money over the next five years. And that is over the whole of the five years, not in one given year. Obviously, I'm not going to spend that kind of money in one year. So, okay. to put that in context, if we were looked at allocations for, that are coming in to the sort of the, the whole county, there's us, there's called BCCG, there's the county council and the area team. Now, that's how they sp the allocations to get. The area team is over the whole of our patch, the, so the whole of Hertfordshire and Northamptonshire. So the challenge we've got, we've got an ageing population, growing population. That means people are going to need more healthcare. And cases are getting more and more complex, so we have to change the way we spend money. So that's the challenge we've got. The good thing you've got in Hampshire is people and partner organisations are signed up to doing that together. Now, that is obviously the best approach. Obviously, you've got any chance to ask me questions on any of these numbers later. And that's it from me. Okay? So I'll now hand over. Are you coming back up, Dan? Yeah. yeah. So you, you have a choice. No. <laughs> so we had built in a break to because we've got a lot of stands outside, or we could carry on and finish a bit earlier. What is what do the people say? Carry on, carry on. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So let's. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Ben Gallant. I'm the um, uh, Chief Executive here at NEN. And so I'm going to be talking a bit about what's our plan then for the next uh, five years as, as, we, as we go forward from, from today. Um, let me see if I can get this to work. There we go. Um, so why are we here? So the, the, the point of commissioning and organisations is about improving outcomes for the whole of the population. And so um, our, our shared vision is about helping people to live healthier, happier, and uh, more independent lives. And, and as we've talked as a partnership around what we want the, uh, 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 the, the shared agreement to be, we're talking about better care, um, better health, and better value. So get a, getting better outcomes, enabling people to live longer, and getting better um, bang for the buck from the NHS. Um, pound. Um, and it's important we don't lose sight of that because that's the starting point of everything that we're um, trying to do. So as Stuart alluded to, we've been working together with partners from across, the, uh, across health and social care to agree what's the plan going to be to be able to do that over the next five years. Um, the, I mean, Stuart's alluded to some of this, but it, it's not easy. So the starting point in Northamptonshire is a set of financial challenges that face all health and social care uh, organisations, a, a requirement to improve quality standards on an ongoing uh, basis, significant demand pressure on our services, particularly in uh, urgent care. We're one of the fastest growing counties in the country and the population's getting older. So if we just say, oh, we'll keep spending money 
in the ways that we've done it before, then um, what that creates is a big gap over the five years. It means it, it translates into a specific financial gap of, of 279 million, and that's a, a figure that's agreed across all health and social care organisations. Um, and what that means is we're not able to deliver the improvement in outcomes that we're working together to try to achieve. So the context is important because we have to start by accepting that in order to have plans that are actually going to be uh, achievable and deliverable. So the, the basis of our plans, which I think is exciting about Northamptonshire and isn't the same across the whole of the country, if you look across the border at Cambridgeshire, they're looking at doing these massive tenders for frail and older people. That's, that's not the approach that we're looking to take in county. What we're looking on doing is saying, how do we as commissioners work in partnership with providers to get um, the best possible way of improving outcomes for patients? Um, and we believe that if we work together, we've got the best possible chance of making improvements um, in outcomes for the people that we collectively serve. So there are four key planks to the uh, strategy as we move forward. Um, and they're reflected in different ways, and they, and they sit within the individual plans of all the organisations. But they, they, they're, they're, these are the four main areas. So we need to change the way that care is delivered out of hospital. So um, the care we deliver in hospital needs to be the highest possible standard, and it's really important, and we're not saying that that's bad, but we're saying... If we can put a package of services around individuals in their homes that builds on primary and community care providers, then um, what we're doing is enabling that independence um, living that we've heard in the, all the uh, events that we've held is what, is, is what people want. So there needs to be a change. I mean, Darren's talked about the development of GP federations. There needs to be a change, not just in the way that care is delivered, but in the way that care is joined up at a hospital. Uh, and so that's a key part of the strategy. Second part is about how do we, if you look at Northamptonshire, essentially we have a set of services, acute services that are provided twice, once at Northampton General and once at Kettering General. So what, 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 those, what the two hospitals have done is committed to working together to say, well, what's a sensible way of us partnering to ensure that there's a coherent service provision model for um, people in Northamptonshire? And we're saying as commissioners that we will work with the clinicians to actually do what's sensible and do what's right for the, for the county. The third point that does come out of partnership only is if we work together as organisations, we can collectively use the money that's available better than if we work on our own. So if you take things like estates, IT, HR, by all the organisations in the county working together looking at how they're doing that, we can do that in a way that's better and also in a way that makes a more effective use of resources. So we're looking at how we do that. And then the fourth area is currently health and social care operate uh, at their two different organisations, the two different commissioners, and they work in, in different ways. But all the feedback we have is that people don't just have health needs or social care needs, people have both. And what they want is that care, whether it's health care or social care, to be coordinated and built around individuals. So we see it as our responsibility to join health and social care together so that it's seamless in its provision for, um, for the individuals who need that care. And um, the Better Care Fund is a way that uh, the government have set out that budgets can be pulled between health and social care to start us on that journey. The ambition that we have um, with Robin and the Health and Wellbeing Board is to, uh, is to accelerate that and to do that uh, in a way that delivers the maximum benefit um, and is as fast as it can be for the people of, of Northamptonshire. So, <coughs> in terms of developing our strategy, where we are today is there is a uh, commitment to joint working and, and the leaders of all the health and social care organisations are working together on a single plan, which I think is uh, exciting. And what each leader is doing is saying, how is the plan for my organisation uh, part of 
the plan that we've collectively got for the county as a whole. Um, that work builds on the work that some of you remember from Healthy Together that became Healthy Northamptonshire and is where we are, what, where we are today. The, the key for me, and I think the key aspect that clinical commissioning groups bring, is having clinicians who are inspired to make change and feel empowered to be able to make that change happen, supported by the resource to actually deliver that, that change. And so what we're doing is we're saying to the clinicians um, who deliver care in the county, how can we support you to tell us what the changes are that are right and then for us to put them in place? Plans aren't finished, they're still in development, um, but we're excited about the journey that we're on. And it's not just about plans. I know there's a frustration sometimes when we talk about what we're going to do, but what are, what are we actually doing? As Darren alluded to, you know, the, work, the work started last year. There are things that are coming online now that are actually taking place. We've got um, uh, acute liaison psychiatry service that's starting in, in both Kettering General and Northampton General uh, in September. We've got uh, a GP stream um, live in Northampton General and Kettering General now with plans to expand that over the winter. And we've also got really exciting plans for investing um, our collective resource in domiciliary care capacity because we know that's going to free up beds in the community hospitals, in the acute hospitals and um, provide space in reablement services. That means that, that you know, the number of people that we've got waiting in hospital to be discharged who don't need to be there can actually get out of hospital and be cared for in an environment that's most appropriate for them. So there, there is real change happening today, but we've also got plans to, to develop um, going forward. And I thought it'd be really helpful as we go, um, as, as we move on from now, to have one of our clinicians, so Dr. Matthew Davis, who's one of the clinical directors here at NEN, to talk about specifically the out-of-hospital strategy and the plans that we've got for that. So, Matthew. Press the right button, stand in the right place, look at everybody, and, 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 and nothing's happening. <laughs> ah, there you go. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm a GP in Daventry and have been involved with various commissioning organisations for a while. And one of the things that I think is exciting at the moment is the fact that when we talk about uh, primary care uh, and general practice strategy and what we're looking at now is beginning to talk about health rather than, than, than sickness. And the vision that uh, we've developed for uh, community and uh, the provision of community care is, is all about putting people at the centre of that care and actually allowing them to live as much as possible, uh, as close to home for, for as much as their, their time and actually embodying that in a vision that I think in the past we always imagined that we were going to provide services that would cure illnesses but actually the recognition that, that people uh, experience uh, their life and look to live their life as well as possible. And I think all of the clinicians will tell you that the person who is able to look at the positive aspects of their life and uh, celebrate their health rather than look at the problems that they got, they get, actually with the same level of disease will be a, a lot, lot better. And, and we've developed this vision in Northamptonshire, which really talks about the, the ability of, of people having self-care and that being a personalised self-care. And I think we've learnt a lot from social care about how that can be done effectively. Now, the main bits of, uh, of that are very much around placing people at the centre of that, uh, that, that, that way of doing things and allowing them to have that but using that almost step up through the community hub, which works between and health and social care as an access point to allow people to have uh, the experience of well-being. Through that, through the uh, use of rapid response and discharge teams, and actually then having really effective urgent care when we possibly need it. What, that, what that's likely to look like as an operating model, and, th and this is the kind of thing that, that we need to 
think about how would we deliver a service when we're actually going to come and commission a service rather than what somebody would experience the care. And the bit to look at in this diagram is the two arrows. And starting on the left-hand side with, with the top arrow, and we're looking at people uh, having less... Uh, as they go up the scale with becoming less well, so there's less activity uh, but greater illness. But then in the bottom arrow, making sure that uh, when you do have an episode of ill health which needs really excellent care in hospital, we can start planning for you to get back to your, your home environment as soon as possible uh, because we know that particularly for older people, spending as little time in hospital as possible is best for their health and they get back to a much better sense of functioning uh, if, if they can be uh, have the care done as close to home as possible but also recognising that community beds have got a role to play in this as well. So that's great. That's an operating model. That's the kind of thing that as commissioners we have to think about and we have to chunk it up to, to make it possible. What does that actually mean for, 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 for people? How are, how are they going to experience care differently? And I think there's three points about this, that we get away from this kind of almost Heath Robinson design of care where the uh, cardiac nurse will trip over the respiratory nurse who will uh, have the district nurse on, on, on your, your garden path to actually somebody who knows you and can work as a partner to develop a care plan for you. Now, the most important thing for me as a GP with somebody with diabetes might be that uh, their HbA1c is uh, the requisite uh, number. But actually for the person it might be that they can go to, to do their shopping or it might be important that their, their, their carer, their spouse who is their carer is supported so that we can actually build into that care plan for them uh, really ef effective ways of, of, of dealing with, with problems. But also we support people, the second key point is that we support people who, who have uh, to have their own care. So actually the best way of achieving health is to, is to take control of the issues that you've got. So this sense from people who've got good health, have actually taking uh, care about that good health. And earlier on in the, the, the public board meeting, we received the uh, Director of Public Health's report, and that was clear that we at this stage can all uh, improve our self-care but you take that through the whole way through somebody's uh, health journey that we actually allow them to do it and health has got a lot to learn because we've actually we actually tend to be a sickness service. We we, we tend to 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 uh, spend a lot of time talking to people about their their sickness rather than their health. And the other really important thing that uh, it will be different for people is that you, you, we, we we come out with this mantra of the right the right care in the right place at the right time. What we actually mean is that. Unless there's another reason for it, your care will be where you live. Um, and we will absolutely make sure, you know, Ben's already talked about having much more domiciliary care to allow people to get back to, to, to where they live. And you know, if you think about people with dementia, the most important thing for them is that they are in their familiar surroundings. So rather than just talking in the right care in the right place at the right time, which means that you have your heart transplant down in London somewhere, Actually, what we mean by that is, unless there's another reason for it, we're going to do it at, at, at home. Janet. There you go. Finished abruptly, to surprise everybody. <laughs> so that, that's, that, that, that's, that's my bit about, uh, about primary care, and, and uh, you'd expect me. But I think... Oh, all right. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so we're, I, I'm, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so we've completed our, our presentations. Um, so we, we've rattled through that quicker than we thought. Um, so 
no, we've, I've got some written questions, and, and, but clearly uh, we were going to have a break when there was going to be more time for you to write down your questions. So happy to take uh, you, you know, just questions from the floor. I'm going to direct, uh, direct them to my director colleagues mostly, so, so I'm very lucky. Can we but, make copies of the presentation? Yeah, well, they will be uploaded to our website, and, and the whole video is going to be uploaded to our website. Um, the, the, the very detailed annual report is actually on our website as well. So all, all, of, all of the figures that were alluded to, that, that will all be on there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, so um, as, as our, uh, Liz said, so because we're recording this, so just to re repeat, yeah, I mean, I'll... People will see my face, but they won't need to see your face, so, so I don't feel to, uh, if, you, if you'd like to turn around and feel free. Um, so if I can start off with, with the first question. So, um, so it's, uh, it comes from uh, Michael Brown. Um, the, distance tar the distance to target for Northampton and NCCG shows a reduced funding level of 59.8 million. What are you doing to increase our funding and dramatically reduce our distance to target? And when do you believe that we will get our full funding level? So if I direct that to either Ben or, yeah, to Ben. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that question. Um, so for those who don't know, that what that means is the distance to target is if you take the criteria that's used, which is like a, a weighted uh, capitation formula that, that's then applied, you can then calculate the amount that each uh, county or CCG should get, and then you can compare that with what we actually get. And so if you look at Northamptonshire as a whole, then it is um, just shy of £60 million short in terms of its allocation of getting what it, that what it should be getting from the um, strict application of the uh, formula. Now, that formula, or the, or the way the allocation is uh, actually given out, is decided by NHS England, and it's decided nationally. And we have tried, every time we see NHS England, we say, but well, we have £60 million less in county than we ought to have, so, you, you know, how, how can we possibly do some of the things that you're asking us to do? Um, but they've made some decisions a, a, a about that. Um, do I think we will ever get the full amount? No. <laughs> what, uh, in terms of what can be done about it, I think the, uh, actually, politicians lobbying is probably the best chance we've got of increasing the um, amount that's going to come into this county. So. Uh, would welcome support from our, our, our political colleagues in, in ensuring that Northamptonshire does get the money that it, that it should have as a, as a, as a county. In a year's time, there could be another government. The whole ball game could change. Could do. Sorry, so, the question, so the question was, in a year's time, there'll be another government and it could be a whole new ball game. I, I guess that's right, but what I don't... I don't... Because the government isn't set in the way that the money, the, the total NHS pot is divided between the different... Uh, CCGs, that's done by NHS England. So that, that, that will stay. And so unless there's explicit political pressure put on NHS England to change it, um, I can't see it changing uh, massively. So I wouldn't want to set an expectation that that money's going to come because genuinely, uh, I, I don't think it will. Thank you. So I'll take one more written question, then we'll do some... Yeah, well, I'll, I'll come to you. I, actually, I'll, I'll, we'll... we'll yeah, okay, but uh, we'll come to you with the microphone. Let's, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get our team to work. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah. um, so this is from Anita Shield. So the, um, the Red Report, um, she's saying, the locality governance, what confidence can you give me that internal control weaknesses will improve within your action plan, and how long will it take for there to be an improvement? So, so, so the locality gov in, in the red report, the locality governance, what confidence can you give me that internal control weaknesses will improve within our action plan and how long will it take for there to be an improvement? 
Yeah. So that related to an interim audit report, which um, I asked to be done on um, what is the governance within our eight localities, which was from when I started in the CCG, I just wanted to check that everything that we were inheriting from the PCT had the right governance on, on what I could improve upon. So that report did suggest that, and I emphasize this, while it was under the, the sort of PCT, there were things that were done perhaps not in the correct sort of governance, but all those actions have been taken. I also used that report then to go and strengthen what is the financial governance around each locality, so that's actually done. And we've actually sent the internal auditors back and they've said that is the case. So those, those governance and structures are actually in place and done throughout the whole of this financial year. But at the start, when I sent them in, they did find certain things that they said could be improved. So we've done that. Okay. To answer the person's question, yes. Okay. So, so if we can take this, ladies. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's um, Diana Kingston speaking. Uh, Mr. Van Gowland, I believe, that said that we were merging, or some part of was merging, with Hertfordshire, I thought he said. I was a little bit hard of hearing. So um, what worries me is we've got in Northamptonshire a big, very distribution outlets. We've got a lot of mo main motorways. And our what we need here in Northamptonshire will be nothing like they need down the next few counties. So I'm just wondering how much is um, that is taken into account with the expenditure, especially on the accident side. Yeah, do we? Uh, yeah, so apologies if it's probably the way I said it. So just to be clear, um, there's no there's no merger with Hertfordshire. No. No. So what we're saying is the plan is just for Northamptonshire. So when we first took over as a CCG uh, 18 months ago, the first thing we did was say that the programme that existed across the whole of South East Midlands, that included Milton Keynes, Luton and Bedford, didn't make sense for the people of Northamptonshire because really people from Kettering aren't going to go to Luton. So that's why we said the programme needs to concentrate just on Northamptonshire. So that the, 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 the five-year plan we've got is built purely around the county and what the county needs. And there's no, there's no merger with, with any other county. Okay. okay. Yes, this gentleman at the back. Yes, good evening, thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Smart. I'm actually here on behalf of White Hills and Spring Park Residents Association. But I guess for the purposes of tonight, you should change residents for patients. Um, I'm also speaking on behalf of a number of uh, residents associations across the town who are currently researching the impact on the infrastructure of Northampton uh, and in particular for tonight, acute health care. To explain the issue and then ask the question, the issue is that the West Northampton Joint Planning Unit core strategy plans to put 25,000 additional houses around the boundary of Northampton. The question is, when, I, when we've researched all of the strategy documents, including your five-year strategy, we fail to see any link or joined-up approach. We fail to see any cross-referencing between these key county strategic documents. So the question is, how can you reassure the residents of Northampton that these plans are all linked and joined up? And to evidence that, I've had one meeting with the General Hospital, Northampton General Hospital, where, unless my uh, hearing was wrong, they're talking about a 2% annual uh, growth. But the core strategy actually talks about nigh on a 20% growth for Northampton. How can that be joined up? And how can you reassure these residents that there is some link between the various strategic thinking of the various bodies looking after our acute health care. Okay, that's a very good and challenging question. Is Matthew going to take that? 
th th there's, there's sorry, I didn't see who asked the. Hi, sorry. Uh, there, there, there's two. I think two layers of looking how, how, uh, at that. Um, we talked about the the integrated strategies across the acute providers and the commissioners, and built into that is the population growth that uh, we're expecting within Northamptonshire. And uh, we mentioned this very large financial gap, and part of the driver of that large financial gap is that Northamptonshire is, I think, the most rapidly growing population in 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 the county. So we have factored in the expectation that there will be more people doing and um, we will need to do more things for those people so within the acute sector there will be a need for uh, growth within the acute sector and I think if you looked at the figures that Stuart presented despite the fact that we are going to care for more people in their own homes there's still an increase in spending in the in the acute sector so we have factored it in uh, and we've, uh, but the, the really important bit is that each of the localities, the eight localities, are looking at a strategy for how they have uh, population growth. So with it, I, I, I'm a GP in Daventry, we've got a large projected population growth uh, and we've actually, the, house, the, the building of houses has just restarted and, it, uh, and we've noticed that we've got a, uh, an increase in the population. So what we're doing as, as a locality is looking at what will that mean for the, the primary care services that we have to deliver in, in, in Daventry? And then we will go to the CCG with plans about how, how firstly, we'll, we'll deliver uh, same-day care. So at the moment in Daventry, there's two practices, and I can envisage in the next two or three years where we deliver same-day care together because we use the same computer system. So we begin to look at it based on a locality, and I'm, I, I, the localities in, in South and East Northampton and West Northampton, where all of that growth is going to come, will do exactly the same thing about how do you develop different systems of care. So it, 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 it's in the detail of, of the planning assumptions that were um, that were uh, submitted to NHS England at, at the end of uh, at the end of June. So yes, there's a, a and, and again, you know, let's be honest, it's a real challenge to all of us. We're completely aware of that challenge as, as GPs. You know, we we're caring for more people the, the whole time, but actually, we're planning to to do something about that as well. Uh, my name is Anita Shields. My question is to do with uh, GPs uh, uh, not performing practice uh, and a special measure that possibly could be taken if those uh, practices are, are not efficient enough. What would happen to the patients? That means the patient will have to be transferred to another practice uh, and that could mean uh, further miles for the patient to go and uh, that would also create another uh, problem, which will be an increase in population for that other practice. So what is the solution to this? Yeah. If I can invite my colleague, the, who's uh, Kamal Sood, who's a GP and our clinical executive director for primary care. Hi. Um, I think that that appalling prospect is something which would be a very unusual event. Uh, by the time that a practice is having problems, um, we would be working with the local area team, whose job, in fact, it is to hold the contract for general practitioners. It is not a contract that we hold, <clears throat> but we contribute to the quality changes that occur. Before the, 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 uh, the time came for a practice to be closed, uh, there would be a whole level of support given to the practice and the practitioners to help them to improve. Frequently, I think the, the subtext of your question, which perhaps isn't overt, the problem that our community has is that there are not enough GPs. And, and, and it's that there not being enough GPs means that those that are there are under increasing pressure, having to work harder, and sometimes that creates situations where you're going to be not delivering the quality of care that you would yourself have the ambition to do. But not only do we have 
mechanisms of supporting as we go along that acute situation. As a CCG, we are working towards a plan about how do we enhance the manpower in our community. And, and that manpower isn't just general practice manpower, which to an extent I think is difficult to suddenly reinvent. You know, a GP comes out of a medical school uh, at the age of 28 or 29. If we made a change, we couldn't suddenly do that. But, you know, we are looking at a more creative way of using the fullest level of staff that we have. How do we get more nurses involved? How do we train nurses to be at a higher level doing some of the tasks which previously were traditionally done by general practitioners? So I think I understand your, the question that you're formulating. I don't think at this moment in time I'm seeing a practice come to that point. Um, if practices were beginning to come to that point, we would be there helping them, supporting them um, in whatever ways we can to try getting them so that that practice remains there in your locality. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, hello, I'm Karen Pierce. Um, I'm really pleased to hear about the Health and Social Care Outcomes Framework and your commitment to integrated mm -hmm. and coordinated care. Um, and I'm just wondering if in your strategy you've got any particular focus on neurological conditions. Um, I've got a particular interest around rare and rapidly progressing uh, neurological disease and how you would actually link locally into the voluntary sector to support with some of your integrated uh, pathways and development there. Okay. Shall we wait? Yeah. So Matthew's going to come and answer that question. I, I think there's a... There's a sorry. <laughs> it's very difficult to talk to. to, to. Um, the, 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 the voluntary and third sector is a, is a key part of, uh, of our vision of how the community hubs will work. Um, and we know that there's a huge amount that is done for people on a day-to-day -day basis that um, if we could join that up with uh, what's happening in the, the health sector, the social care sector, the, the, the whole will be greater than, than the parts. And uh, we also need to help people with, with rapidly progressing conditions. And I think one of the issues is that you've got people with smaller, uh, not smaller, with uh, less common diseases who often get uh, almost, uh, I'm, forgotten is not the right word, but it, but it almost feels like that because you've got diabetes, you've got heart failure, you've got COPD, you've got all of these, these big long-term conditions where we, we focus a, a lot of our efforts. And it's very important that the community hubs embrace all of what's happening. But the other bit, that, and, and I think this is a bit where Northamptonshire has led the way, is that we begin to work on really personalising people's care plans. So in the past, yeah, I think that we've got uh, people to conform to the system that we've put in place, not got the system to provide care for people. And we've done the, the, the piece of work which was done with people with complex mental health needs around personalised care planning, and it was a huge success. And the really interesting thing was that it was more successful the more complex the, the problem came, beca became. And I think what we need to do, and you know, neurological conditions I think are a really good example, is actually allow people and support people to personalise that care so that it, it, it uses the voluntary sector, it uses the, the, the health sector and it uses the social care sector to support what that person needs, not what we, and, and I think doctors are the worst, that this uh, perceive that that, that that person needs. Thank you. Well, well, there's another question. I, I do have another written question down. Um, I think, is Santiago still here? Oh, he's gone. So the, the, the question he, he was asking about uh, the risk stratification tool for identifying patients at high risk of admission. So this was about a, um, through NHS England, there was guidance around each GP practice should identify the uh, top 2% of patients who were at most risk of um, being admitted to hospital. 
And, and the guidance was that we should use a risk stratification tool. So this is where um, it's a computer software that helps to identify these patients rather than the clinical hunch. Um, that was meant to be developed by NHS England, but there was a lot of slippage. So his, his question was, um, so why, why did the timetable slip, essentially, and how much did the risk stratification tool cost for NEM? So who, should I ask? So if I can invite Jan Janet Su Chong, who's our Deputy Chief Executive and uh, Director for Strategy and Primary Care. Thank you. Um, well, it seems quite a technical and in some ways obscure question, but I'm pleased that it's been raised because um, it gives me an opportunity just to explain a little bit further from what Darren said. So you'll remember in the earlier slides that Ben presented, he talked about the need to care for people proactively to provide integrated care. He also talked about the increasing pressure that health and social care services are operating under um, owing to demographic changes and, and, uh, another, uh, and also uh, further factors. Um, traditionally, health and social care has been provided to those people that come forward, that step forward and uh, request, or, or request a referral or an appointment. In order to make the best use of scarce resources, um, we are increasingly required and actually see the, the utility of using what's called a risk stratification tool. So typically these tools, they are algorithms, computer software, and for each individual member of the population, they will look at a range of factors which includes admission to secondary care, outpatient appointments, GP appointments, and it calculates what's called a risk score. And that risk score is um, a, a predictor of how likely it is that that person will end up needing secondary care going forward, perhaps next winter or the winter after. And having this information on a per practice basis and cross-matching it with social care information gives the uh, statutory organizations a fighting chance of trying to target care to where it's most needed. So if you think about the winter coming and what you might want to do um, in terms of safeguarding your, your car, you might want to top up the windscreen wash, you might want to check the tire pressure. It gives the opportunity for health professional teams working together across agencies to target people that might otherwise need help. And the, obviously the point of this is to work upstream to manage demand and help to keep the pressure away from our acute hospitals so that that's applied to people where it's most needed. And as Darren said, the question is really about um, the process that we're undergoing to uh, procure the software, how we might make it work, and uh, we may well use our local commissioning support unit to provide the technical expertise. This isn't something that you would do every day. So um, because we know the CSU are supporting other CCGs, we'll probably look to them for some advice and guidance. So I hope that helps a little bit with that question. Thank you. Yes, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yes. John Pepiat. Thank you. Um, just wondering what the position of NEEN commissioning is on ageism in the treatment of patients. Okay. Do you have a position on this? Because, you know, with the limited things and... Yes. So do, do you want me to open, actually? It's, I'd like to invite, so, uh, Peter Boylan, who's our Director of Quality, um, <coughs> to answer that one. Actually, <laughs> who is that? Yeah. You there, sir? Um, I think that's a question that any of us could answer, yeah. actually. Um, I don't think that we have any policies within this county that restrict treatment on an age basis. Well, I certainly had a case in Northampton, a cancer patient who was refused treatment based on his age. And he went on to have treatment, and he's still alive now. And he's okay. I, I'm not aware of it, and it hasn't been brought to my attention, and unless any of my colleagues can counteract that, I'll, I, I, it's, not it, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not an issue. If people have got an issue with that or something has happened, then bring it to our attention and we'll investigate it. Um, to uh, to complement his question, um, you've put on the slide uh, a 
don't know exactly where. Uh, sorry, customer, sorry um, to, if you can just for the recording. Yes, um, you've put on the slide customer satisfaction. I would like to know what type of question for customer satisfaction precisely for this kind of example you provide for the population so like that they can see if there is improvement in various care, especially I'm interested about uh, the care of elderly <coughs> in their own home. <coughs> After say for instance, I have read uh, uh, a hip replacement what do you do exactly for them to have physiotherapy? I'm comparing the service in this country with Belgium for two elderly gentlemen. One in Belgium had physiotherapy straight away after the accident. Here, the person was a little bit older and has received hardly anything at all. The conclusion of this is that one is up and running, manner of speaking, <laughs> for his age, and the other one, he can't even walk, he's with a Zimmer frame. This is not acceptable, because if you want to care after people in their own home, you have to, prov you have to provide some kind of security, some kind of confidence to these kind of group of people who will be seeking that information. So this is my question. <laughs> There's quite a few questions, I think, in there. <laughs> um, I think uh, the example that you've given um, is is one that uh, it, it's not. It's as a, as a commissioning group, we don't obviously see all of the complaints that members of the public make to individual hospitals. Although there is an ability for anybody to make a complaint about any NHS care that they receive to a CCG like ourselves, and we do get um, some complaints. It's not a complaint that I'm familiar with. Um, we've also got to remember that there's a number of healthcare professionals, so although this gentleman that you've referred to hasn't necessarily received physiotherapy that you feel he possibly should have had, there were other healthcare professionals, including that, that gentleman's GP, that, that would be involved in that person's care after they've gone home, um, and and the GP really is the is the, the the sort of mainstay of that person's care at home. They're the gatekeeper of the care that that person should be having once they've gone home. Um, I'm not sure I can answer the question that you've given me in totality because without looking at the individual case, um, that's difficult to. To do, but I'm happy to talk to you afterwards if you want me to look at something specifically. Um, I think that's probably the, the best I can do right now, but I would have thought that the GP is a key person in that, in that relationship and, and could quite easily have, have changed that position. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Andrew. Oh, hi, Darren. Um, <laughs> first, uh, my apologies for not getting here at the beginning. So if you said something in your performance about this question, um, I apologise for not hearing it earlier. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Bailey from Carer's Voice. Um, my, we've heard a lot this evening about increased care at home and um, in the community. And indeed, a number of the quest questions and answers that have followed through recently have... Um, all covered effectively that sort of issue. Mm -hmm. um, so my concern is that in the presentations that I saw, the carer word never appeared. I think um, Matthew unfortunately slightly let the word slip out when he was talking about support at, um, mm. at home. But <clears throat> at the moment, um, monies are being transferred within from um, NEN commissioning into the Better Care Fund which will be jointly managed, and that figure for carers locally should be about £1.3 million based on typical government estimates. But, of course, at the moment, um, your combined NEN and Corby funding for carers is of the order of about £800,000. 
given the increased commitments that you will be expecting of the carer community and the proven efficiencies in the way that we do deliver care into the carer's community, can we have some sort of undertaking that you will actually push to increase the amount of money that is spent on carers and supporting carers? Because if you don't get them right, mm. you're really going to screw up on what your whole objective is. Thanks. Sure. So, so the question essentially, so I mean, just to be very clear, as you know, we really value carers and, and support them as best we can. In terms of the specific question, are, what are the plans to support them in, and back that up with resource? So I'm looking either at Ben or Stuart to answer this question. Hey. Extra resource. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so I, I think an important point to make about the Better Care Fund, which I, I, I'm sure you know, but I think it's worth reiterating, is that it's not new money. So there's, there's not a, a pot of £40 million that's suddenly being created in the county that's then the Better Care Fund. So um, however we use the money has to um, uh, improve outcomes and deliver a saving somewhere else. So I think, I, think, I think that's the first point to make. I think the second point to make is absolutely uh, recognise the contribution, uh, often unseen contribution, that, that carers make and the importance uh, of that. Clearly a key part of the strategy is, as you say, supporting people at home. Uh, ensuring that services that are provided for people uh, are around them at home. And a key part of that, again, is, a, is around the role of carers. And I think as we go forward, what we'll need to do is, is work with yourself uh, and colleagues to understand, as we develop specific schemes that form part of the Better Care Fund, how we ensure that the carer contribution and role in those schemes is identified so that we can therefore identify funding and map how that's used. So I guess what I can't do is say this is the quantum of what we'll spend in carers, but what I can do is say as we develop schemes through the Better Care Fund, we'll make sure that we, we include explicitly the, the carer contribution to that. Okay, thank you. I think we, so we have time for uh, probably two more questions. So. Gail Chapman, so Kettering. Yes. Um, you spoke in your presentation about the 18-week referral to treatment um, yes. target. Um, I wonder if you could just give me some clarification, please, as to introduction of a change. When a patient sees their GP, normally the referral process, if they were deemed to require specialist intervention, was for that direct referral to take place. I've been spoken to by several members of the public who explain that they see their GP, they may be deemed to require surgical intervention or specialist referral. However, until it's been approved by the CCG, that referral is not taking place. So my first part of the question is why that uh, introduction into the process has been deemed necessary and what criteria or basis is used to decide whether or not that referral is successful. Okay, can I invite Kamal to, so, so essentially it's the, I think what you're alluding to is the prior approval process. Yeah. Hi, Ed. who was it who asked the question? Yeah, I mean the whole, the whole idea of the prior approval process is we acknowledge as a healthcare system, and I think we acknowledge with you as our customers, we don't have endless amounts of money. Not every change, not every intervention that is humanly possible can be afforded. There are some interventions which are on evidence base deemed to be of a lower order of priority, or there are some interventions which are timed so that we get the best value for the patient, safest value, at the right time. So for instance, if somebody has hip pain, uh, I could go and present myself with my hip pain to my GP, and I could sit there and say, well, look, I want to see a specialist and I want to have a new hip. Perfectly reasonable points. What the GP is asked to do is assess me, examine me, see how much of a problem it is, investigate, do an x-ray, and then use a questionnaire to see how much that hip pain affects my quality of life. 
With all of that information, we put it through a system where we think, yep, we're going to get as the, the hip replacements done to the people with the greatest need. So that is why we do what we do. What you can get as a guarantee is that 18-week pathway is not significantly adversely affected. Um, say running with my hip pain for a moment longer, my GP goes and asks for the permission and it is appropriate. That is turned around within a week. My GP would have that, uh, um, yeah, go ahead, that, that this fits the criteria, go ahead, make the referral. So it will be within a week that's done. And if my needs do not meet the criteria, an explanation will be there as to why and what it is that uh, means that, that that referral will not be made. That's the reason why we've got it. Prior to this, what happened was the loudest, most vociferous patient would get the surgical care they wanted, rather than the most needy patient getting that care which they need. As a healthcare system, we have to be needs-led rather than wants-led. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. So I think, yeah, we have time for one last question. Are you supporting the yes. 10 minutes? Uh, hold on, hold on. That's. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just we, we want to capture everybody's questions, so when it gets yeah, uploaded. It's only a quick one, really. Yeah. Um, Kettering Hospital wants 10 million to revamp their A&E. Are you supporting that um, claim? I know it's made, it was made some time ago, and they're still waiting to get the money. Yeah. I mean, their A&E has gone up from 30,000 to 70,000, yeah. and they do need to do something about it. And I just wonder what lean yes. commissionings do to push the government to make the decision, because they've got plenty of money for overseas aids and planes and Chinook yes. helicopters, yes. but they don't have money for yeah. our health yeah. service. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so if I can invite Stuart Rees to, to answer that question. Okay, thank you for the question. There's a, a distinction yeah, we need to make, first of all, that obviously there's revenue funding which we get, which we spend for patients, and to build an AD department, that's capital spent. So of the CCG, we don't have capital to give to our providers. So this would be us supporting Kettler General Hospital in going forward for that case. And obviously, we do support them. So that's about it, all we can say at the moment. I, I don't have the gift of giving them the money. OK? Thank you. <laughs> OK, so, so that concludes our AGM. It just leaves me to um, give a few thank yous. So I want to thank you all for um, you know, taking time to come out this evening. It's a lovely sunny evening to um, ask us questions and listen to our presentations. I want to um, thank the entire NEN commissioning team. So I think, you, you know, it is a real challenge. Um, you know, we all do it because we, you know, we really want the best for patients. So I think to commend all of, all of the team and all of, us and all of the staff, to commend all of our member practices. So we know, how, you know, as a GP, you know, we all know very closely the pressures that are put on general practice. We know that they often get a, a bad press when it's completely unwarranted at times, and, and we're there to absolutely support our colleagues. And, and lastly, just to um, thank all of our health and social care partners, because I think it's been alluded to for the very first time, we have plans that um, align and, that, and, and we, we're all in this together to, to really provide the best possible life from beginning to end. So thank you very much.